Kona for me has always been everything, really. Um, I have dreamt of it. Sam Lalo, you're still saying to yourself, yeah, I like you envisioned it, you dreamed it. Could I be Ironman world champion today? But well, I think he's been watching this sport since he was a little kid. He knows every bit of the magnitude here, and here's his story. Thanks for having me out at your run. Four weeks post Canada. How are things? Well, unfit. <laughs> but thanks for having me. Uh, the 37th from last place finisher in Kona. <laughs> Have you taken the whole time off since Kona? Or uh, I'm trying to mean. one of your first runs back. Yeah, I've been a bit injured. Actually, a few days before Kona, I had pain in my foot and it's been, it's been niggling me. So, uh, yeah, I'm not very fast and I'm not very fit, but. Uh, Kona 2023 is still a long way away, so yeah, yeah, kind, of, kind of forced rest, which is nice. Yeah, exactly. So I've been uh, packing in the meetings and calls and runs with videographers. And just <laughs> pain in the ass. <laughs> so I'm actually very curious to learn more about, obviously, the, uh, the year that was, 2022, and yeah. then we can get into talking a little bit more about how you, uh, I guess, how the build-up was for Kona. Yeah, I think... I guess we could call it a breakthrough year in a way. I don't feel like my level is like shot up a notch. I just feel maybe I've learned to race a bit better. Yeah. Um, also during the pandemic, it was kind of like, if you're an up and coming athlete during the pandemic, you kind of got forgotten about. So coming into the pandemic, I was like ranked 240th. And then like suddenly when I came out of it, I was 20th. So uh, this year I've kind of gone from 20th to 4th, which is obviously a good job. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I was already there or thereabouts. And so I guess we could do a really short summary of, of the year and the highlighted races. So what went well, what went poorly before we can talk a little bit more about the kind of build up. Yeah, um, I started off actually same, with the same issue on my foot as I did last year. Okay. As I did like this year. And uh, so in January I was still walking. And. Uh, I think it was a good thing because it meant I came into the season like a bit late and was like fresher for Kona. Um, it was a bit weird for us this year. We had a we had a World Champs in May in St George, the Ironman World Champs, which counted for last year during the pandemic. And then so we had to kind of the season was super long for us. And so I came into St George relatively unfit, um, but just had a really good race and came eight. And like everybody was like, okay, wow, like this. And even I thought that I was like, okay, I can, I can contend with the best. Yeah. They kind of went unnoticed, but I knew deep down that like, I wasn't fit relatively. Uh, so then after St George, uh, I just kind of focused on the PTO races. Had uh, the Collins Cup, where I had an amazing race. Yeah. It involved shitting myself like 78 times. So. <laughs> Um, yeah. now, so that was a real shitter of a day, um, and then actually both PTO races, so we have these new events which are like, basically they invite the top 40 in the world uh, to race, it's almost a half Ironman distance, they call it the 100k distance because it adds up to 100k, yep. uh, and I had really solid races there, I came fourth in both of them, yep. I'm just lacking a bit of run speed, like I would both times I came off the bike with the front guys. Yeah. I just need to learn to run faster, really. So, yeah. Yeah, if you've got any tips for me, <laughs> I'll take them. Well, you mentioned in uh, in a podcast episode with, with with us a couple of weeks ago that you know you, you sort of 10k is you, you'd expect to run sort of 31 low or 30 high in a marathon, maybe even at 225. I guess some of those guys that we've been you on the run are probably running a little bit quicker at 10k, but then you're obviously a bit stronger on the bike. Yeah, the swim, definitely. So, yeah. I've always had this ability of like, I can hold my threshold for a really long time, yep. but I just can't, can't go much faster. So, yep, yep. I'm trying to teach the body to do that, although, like, at the end of the day, my goal is still Kona, yep. and nobody's running like super fast in Kona, you know? Like, the fastest, the record's 236, and I mean, I could probably do that now if I really kill myself, even like when I'm under it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's and so after the PCO races, 
um, you obviously switched full focus to the to the Ironman training, or you probably were still Ironman training through those. Yeah, training similar, really, to be honest. Um, yeah. yeah, I think people over. Well, I found that people over focus on Kona. Um, like you need to. I was actually, I was worried about what I was doing. So like three weeks before, I sent a message to to both Jan Fredino and Daniel Ari about what to do for Kona, and Jan said. Uh, just take it as another race, you know. And so that's what I did. I just, I just carried on training like I would. Nothing special. I, people always say that for Kona you have to I don't know, really focus. I just don't think it's the right way to go about it. Like okay. trying to change. I don't know. People always want to go in a little bit extra or push a little bit more for Kona. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of did the opposite. I was feeling really good um, in the lead up to it. And yeah, I just I was waking up every day. I've done a, I would have done a big day the day before and my HRV was still super high yeah. and I was just yeah feeling healthy really yeah nice okay. and in I guess in the last say six weeks leading into Kona what did some of your stats look like in terms of I know I know you log pretty much everything on Strava yeah but uh, so people can check over there but what were you sort of doing volume wise for all the three disciplines um, let's wait until we get over this roundabout and I'll let you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, we talk about the volumes. Yeah. Say in the last uh, five to six weeks leading up, what were you trying to? If, if you were trying to hit any sort of target at all, or what were you? What was your mindset going into the? Uh, I guess kind of your. Once you get like five or six weeks out, your fitness is difficult to increase fitness, especially we had a we had the PCR race like three weeks before, I think. So we had to taper into that, recover from that, travel to Kona. Um, it's more about the specificity of the event then. So I would do, I haven't looked at hours, but I'm guessing I'd be, I don't think I went over 25, okay. uh, which is not a lot compared to some triathletes. Uh, I've always, my dad and me, who's, my dad's my coach, uh, we've always seen like a real long-term project. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of athletes, I know a lot of athletes who already at 30, 35 hours. Um, but yeah, I said before Kona, I'm only just getting started. Um, now, and then in terms of the actual sessions I was doing, I knew I was fit on the bike, like I was doing, I was doing some race pace efforts, and like, I was having to deliberately up it because my heart rate was so low at that kind of wattage. I was doing like, I was riding at 315, 320 watts, for 30 minutes to an hour and I was like not even over 130 BPM which yeah, right. was like super low for me. Low, yeah. So do you, yeah. Do you know what your max is? Uh, uh like 185. Okay. Yeah. Right. I can actually hit 185 and both biking and running. Most people can get higher running. Yeah. Uh, but yeah I can really push myself on the bike path. Um, and then yeah after Dallas I actually had a like leading into Dallas and afterwards I ran like 17 days consecutively, which for a triathlete is quite long. So I got a good block of running in there. Yeah. Uh, and like, I was I was in a state of mind where I was just like, constantly trying to hold back, trying to do a little bit less. And I was doing some good sessions, but in my head I was like, still doing less than what I felt I was capable of. Right, okay. Yeah, so, right. I was just, yeah, I think, same, I was in a good place. Mentally, I'd just come off a solid performance in Dallas. But like it wasn't so good that like people thought I was one of the favourites, you know? Yes. Um, but like it was really hot day in Dallas, actually way hot in Kona. And people like falling like flies at the end. And I felt like I could like I was like just getting started again. Like I was I felt really good at the end. I felt like I can go much faster, yeah. but I could keep going. And uh, yeah, that's what happened in Kona, I guess. Yeah. And you told me off camera that you were uh... You know, you did the maths and you were fairly confident that you could break eight hours. Yeah. And that's very rarely been done in Kona. I'm curious to know what, you know, why you thought that beforehand. You obviously went and did it. But, you know, how did you break that down? Yeah, uh, I guess, well, first of all, it was really dependent on the bike. I didn't know, you can't really know how fast you're going to ride on the course until you've ridden it. Yeah. Um, and then, like, I knew I was capable of running a sub 245 off the bike. Okay, so I'm curious to know why you, why you thought that as well, going deeper into this. 
Yeah, with, yeah. With I some mean, workouts that you did that you saw that. Or? Yeah, uh, I've done, I've done workouts. Yeah, where I say so my threshold's about like 317 per k on a good day. Yep. Um, 320, 322 on a bad day. And like at them at that level, I mean, I guess we all have a different version of threshold, but like I'm still like at, I don't know 1.5, 1.6 millimoles, which is yeah, really low. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing with me is that I. It's why I'm not so good at short course. Is that like I can't? As soon as I get like over 2.2 or 2.3, that's it. I'm done. You know. So I don't really have. It's not like this perfect graph for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, already two or three years ago, I'd run. I'd run 234 in training. Just and it wasn't. It wasn't like a max marathon. It was just a session. Um, in a continuous in a, in a 42k run. Yeah, we just. My dad wanted me to do, just like more from a confidence aspect, I did one. Yep. Uh, and I wasn't allowed to go over 150 heart rate. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's and, uh, a good yeah. So you're averaging about 334. Something like that, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. And so back to the sub eight hours, so you sort of did the maths on all three and just and just believed that you were capable of doing that. Yeah. And actually people were, people were coming at me before the race saying, oh, are you going to beat the swim record? I was like, no, nah, but I think I could probably do the bike record because it didn't seem it didn't seem crazy to me. And I thought that I thought that a few other guys would do a similar like time to me. Uh, one of the best riders, Magnus, got a penalty. Uh, Sam Long wasn't there. He probably would have had a good bike split as well. But uh, also, like I'd made I'd made a few changes. I actually gone a size up on my bike, which was a bit of a risk. I completely changed my position. Just everything ticked. I felt really, really good. Yeah. Uh, and my yeah, just, my equipment was just a lot better than it had been. The thing is, when you get to Kona, the pros have so much more support, you know. Yes. Uh, I think my bike had seen like three mechanics in the process of Kona. Uh, yeah. I mean, I had like for the first time, I had like a made-to-measure tri stick. There's so many small things that yeah. like add up, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So a couple of questions come to mind. Uh, moving forward into next year, do you think that there's anything to change in the training, or do you think it's just doing oh, more, of, more of the same? Here he is, the man himself. Hey, what's Thank up, you, mate? Yeah. Yeah, hey, mate. Um, anything to change? Uh, or do you think it's about doing sort of more of the same? It's a good Add, question. I think uh, yeah. I used to. I, I'm trying to trust more and more just what my dad gives me. Yep. Um, I've always struggled with um, um, putting like full confidence into my coaches. But I guess when success comes, you kind of more and more confidence. So I try and question it less and less. Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, I think run, the run is definitely, I need to up my running. But where I've got the most gains to be had still, I think it's the bike. like. I see myself riding like in a, in a year or two, like 340 watts in Kona. Like it's generally feasible. On paper, it's already feasible. It's just that I haven't done it. So yeah, um, we'll see. Um, I don't want to change too much. And I just want to let my dad do what he thinks is best. So final question for this run. During Kona, you're obviously in front for a lot of the race or almost, almost the whole way. Um, when you went through the halfway mark or say around 25k mark, you were probably getting uh, some information from people on the sidelines. Did you think that you were going to win at that point or were you still really unsure? Or what was your mindset in the last uh, last 21k, last half marathon? Yeah, so I came into T2 with a six minute lead and the half marathon I had three minutes. So it was going to like come down to the line if we kept the same pace. Yeah. Um, and I kept exactly the same pace pretty much. My second half was very slightly faster than my first. Um, but, so yeah, in my head I was like, if I can get it to 10k to go with like a minute 30, two minutes, uh, I think I've got this. Um, but equally, like in Ironman, you never know, like I've had races, like with 7k to go, I've had like almost a 10 minute lead and I haven't won, you know, so, yeah, yeah. so it just completely blow up. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I didn't really want to let that thought creep up too much into my mind. Yeah. Um, it did at one point, and I remember like 
getting like goosebumps even though it was like fucking 40 degrees. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I was like, had to like slap myself and like Sam wake up, just kind of like focus on what you're doing right now. Yeah. Uh, Cause there's so many small things that you just need to focus on like nutrition, drinking. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Gustav just started dropping like 320Ks, yeah. but like on the worst bit of the course, like where we were all, we were all running like 420 probably. Yeah slight uphill tailwind so you don't get the breeze and it was like how the hell do you do that and then yeah in hindsight I wish I, I heard that he was really struggling like once he'd overtaken me so yeah I think I could have now I don't know he was the better guy in the day but I yeah. let's say I definitely think that they're beatable yeah yeah okay I actually do have one one or two no, no, very you can quickly fire away until we go back <laughs> sorry you can fire away until we get back okay cool uh, it, it leads me to a couple more questions, actually. So, when Gustav passed you, were you were you thinking about Christian and where he was and whether he'd catch you? Obviously, you were thinking that, but like, was there a concern in that final 7K that you would have Christian come up behind you, or did you get information that he was too far back? I know he was still quite close, but yeah, yeah, he was very close. Yeah. Um, actually, the first thought that went into my head when Gustav came was. Just like let's like, let's follow him, you know. Let's yep. let's follow him, go to the line. And for about half a second, I try. Yeah. Like my head really wanted to, and my mind was like, now yeah. we're not having that. And uh, and then from there onwards, yeah, I was just focusing on like I'm not getting caught by Christian. Yeah. I think that made a big difference. People were like like the fact that I split the Norwegian train, you know. I think yeah, yeah, the sandwich. That made yeah. yeah. That made a a big difference. Like. If, if they both would have beaten me, I think my performance would have gone a bit more unnoticed. Yeah. But I'm like, I know I'm aware that I had like I solo TT the whole day pretty much. Yes. Apart from a short bit on the swim where I was in Florian and Angit's feet. Um, and yeah, I mean. And they worked together for a lot of the time. Yeah, I just think that if it was, and I'm a better swimmer than these guys, and like, I think that if it would have been an individual time trial, theoretically I probably would have won. You know, and that's. Yeah. That was good for my for my mind for the next cone, I guess. Absolutely. And did Gustav actually say I'm proud of you when he passed you? Yeah, he did. Yeah, I mean, that's I what wasn't, he said. Yeah. I wasn't in my right mind to know what he said. <laughs> and people asked like if it was planned what we did, like. Yeah. But it's just so it's just natural instinct, you know. I like yeah. I respect Gustav. He respects me, and yeah. yeah, I think I think they both were really proud that both Christian and Gustav were really proud that I kind of took the race to them. Um, and also that like, I'm just, like, I haven't got the massive infrastructures that they've got, you know. Yeah. It's just me and my dad in the garage <laughs> working hard and uh, yeah. I think people like that story, you know, it's a bit Rocky-esque, I guess. For sure.